Today we're going to be looking at another heavily requested Kurtzkazad video. Specifically, what's hiding at the most solitary place on Earth, the deep sea. Did you know there is uranium depth? For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into this. Sometimes the world feels, hmm, boring. We've visited all the remote islands, conquered the Arctic, and penetrated the deepest jungles. But there is still one place to explore. It's, it's interesting how, like back in the days of explorers, and they all thought, uh, here be dragons, there's, we don't know what's in this area, and how we've gotten disappointed as we realized there weren't any dragons there. Maybe there are space dragons out there. A wet and deadly desert inhabited by mysterious creatures living in total darkness. The deep sea. Let's dive down. When we look at the sheer scale of the Earth's oceans, it's hard to believe that less than 2% of all biomass on Earth lives here. And of that small percentage, around 90% is located close to the surface in the first 200 meters. Well, the sun's not there. Sun's a big life giver. This is where we begin our journey. Here, light can still penetrate the water, which allows photosynthesis to occur. Phytoplankton, trillions and trillions of single-celled algae and bacteria make up the foundation of the ocean's ecosystem, and they're consumed by bigger plankton who are consumed by other species, and is often covered with coral reefs, algae and other sea plants that are home to a plethora of sea animals. So far we've focused most of our attention on this comparatively pleasant environment where we fish, swim. Music's very relaxing. <laughs> Also love the Pokemon and Finding Nemo references. Pollute and do science. So, let's dive deeper. Moving from familiar coast waters into deeper, more remote waters, we eventually reach the edge of the continental shelf, where we're confronted with the continental slope, the long descent down to the deep sea. With every additional meter of... This is a really cool animation, and this is one of their older ones, which just goes to show you how long Kurtzkazat's been good water, light fades drastically, which means there are basically no more plants and the seemingly steep continental slope begins to remind us of the surface of the moon. Yeah, water is a great absorber of radiation and, well, sunlight is technically a form of radiation. Not ionizing, but that is just the other thing is you can't see as good if you have water that's deep enough. As far as uranium is concerned, its concentration in the ocean is thought to be an average of about 3 micrograms per liter, which is pretty small, but that figures out to well over 4 billion tons of the stuff. In water so it adds up there's similarly low concentrations of thorium there as well looking out we're faced by what seems to be endless open water let's leave the slope behind us and enter what's known as the twilight zone the you'll see this gauge going up every 10 meters you go below the surface pressure increases by an atmosphere portal to the deep sea as we sink down further the water pressure oh, rises to deadly levels the deepest scuba dive ever came in at 332 meters. At that depth, the pressure is like having 200 cars stacked on top of you. At 33 atmospheres of pressure, that, that gets up there. For reference, a pressurized water reactor is about 150 atmospheres. Yet we've only completed 3% of our journey. While this region seems pretty grim, many fish and other animals actually spend at least half their lives down here. During the day, it's a good place to rest. Now, the undersea uranium is not at a specific depth. It's more of just it's at a very low concentration. So the real challenge is ways to extract it. And it's technically feasible. It's just super expensive. I'd put it sort of in the same category as commercial nuclear fusion and that we know how to do it, but it's it's expensive. And that could involve selectively permeable membranes for uranium ions at that specific density spread out over large areas because you're going to need to cast a wide net. And at that point, you'd need to extract it 
chemically by washing the material with something that would release the found uranium ions. And this could potentially be reused, kind of similar to how cation softeners work in a uh, chemistry cleanup cycle in a power plant. And that's not just a nuclear power plant, that's really in anything involving the use of water. But cation softeners are used to remove impurities from the water and as they catch the cations, they cation meaning positively charged ion. And it's a regenerative, it's a renewable process. It's just very expensive because uranium's at such a low concentration. But hey, if we ever run out of uranium at the surface, it is one way to extend the life of nuclear power plants. Theoretically, if we could extract it all, we could if we just use pure uranium fuel, so nothing, nothing thorium, nothing exotic, nothing fancy, then ocean extraction could extend the proved reserves of uranium by a factor of 500 to 700 times. But it would be a lot harder to do with current technology and method than mining uranium the old-fashioned way. Recover hidden from predators in the vast dark waters. At night, they can travel more safely into shallower zones to feed in the food-rich surface waters. In this transition zone between twilight and darkness, light becomes a powerful tool. Over 90% of the species indigenous to this deep environment use bioluminescence chemicals. Bioluminescence has always fascinated me, and it can be a form of a radiation detector, kind of in the same way that your eyes are technically radiation detectors. I mean, it's produced by a chemical reaction involving specialized enzymes that give you that effect. I remember hearing about environmental assessments using BALO, that's bioluminescent assay using live organisms, and it involves bacteria that detect the presence of toxic chemicals and it could include radioactive substances like uranium and radium in soil samples. So it's cool to see an example of a fun glowy thing that involves radiation, but it doesn't directly cause radiation any more than your eyes causing radiation. It just detects it. Chemicals to create light. They do so as camouflage against the very faint sunlight to send signals to potential mates or to confuse and scare attackers or they use light to hunt. Another Angler tool fish. for survival in the dark is teamwork. At around 700 <laughs> meters, we encounter a colony of siphonophores. They can be up to 50 meters. The way they phrased that made it sound like it was one of those uh, corporate team building activities. Here, we're gonna put you all in the dark and see what happens. <laughs> is in length, but are only as wide as a broomstick. To attract prey, a colony creates a tragically beautiful bright blue or red light and deploys a curtain of tentacles filled with toxic needles that kill anything wow. that comes too close. But most species living down here have to rely on an unlikely resource, marine snow. White, flaky stuff that constantly sinks from the surface to the bottom of the ocean. I've never heard of that. It consists cool. of dead plant or animal parts, fecal matter, shells, sand, or dust. Even though this doesn't sound very tasty. Dead stuff that is super compressed <laughs> at this point when you get this deep, so sure. Without this crucial resource, life in the deep sea would starve. It's in this area that the most fascinating battles between two unlikely enemies could happen. Sperm whales hunt and attack giant squid the size of a house. While the squid fight back ferociously, they probably don't stand a chance, but they do leave permanent yes, yeah. marks on their killer's skin. As we reach 1,000 meters, deep... Always fascinates me to see creatures of that size that can withstand that kind of pressure. It's, it's really cool. Deeper than the tallest structure built by humans, we need to be careful. This is the midnight zone, a place of utter darkness. Explored wet wasteland consisting of nothing but endless black open water. At these depths, it's harder for a human to take a swim than to take a walk in space. Yeah. Finding food down here. Well, space, it's the opposite thing. <laughs> There's no pressure in here, it's all of the pressure. Yeah, we're getting close to reactor coolant system pressure at this point. It's really hard, so life had to adapt and become extremely energy efficient. 
like the 30 centimeter long vampire squid that floats through the water without motion, with long and slender catching arms extended. Massive amount of surface area, not that much volume. Surface area to maximize your strength, but less volume to minimize your weight. Otherwise, yeah, you'd be crushed under your own weight at this point. <laughs> They're covered in tiny stiff hairs, which brush food from the water. This saves a lot of energy compared to actively catching food. Yeah. For carnivorous fish, it's much harder to find food since living prey is quite rare down here. So the hunters have to get a perfect grip on their victim on first strike, otherwise it will escape into the dark. Many deep sea predators have several sets of long and deadly teeth. Like the viper fish, which uses its long fangs to trap even large prey and swallow it whole. Or the frilled shark so cool. with its impressive Whoa. set of 300 teeth, <laughs> which are curved backwards to hook their victims in their mouths. We sink further, below the 3,800 mark, as deep as the grave of the Titanic. We are now at abyssal depths. Here, life happens in slow motion. Preserving every last bit of energy is crucial for survival. Everything down here hovers motionless or swims in a slow, elegant fashion. The only time the animals living in this zone move fast is when they have to escape danger. This kind of reminds me of like very precise spacecraft maneuvers, except it's not moving you very far, but it's, you're just going very slow because you really don't want to run out of energy and how those thrusters have a very limited amount of fuel and you have to use very precise bursts it can go a long way. In a nuclear power plant, it's a bit like when you are starting up the reactor and you are well below the point of adding heat, so you're far less than 1% power. You're at less than 1% of 1% power at this point. And at this point, you're critical, or technically slightly super critical, because power is still going up and you've already started up and you're now raising power. But it's a weird spot to be because a lot of the feedback mechanisms don't really exist yet. In that when you raise power, temperature goes up and that puts in a feedback mechanism that slows your power ascension. But here, you accelerate, you kind of just, you're going to keep going, you're going to cruise on up. So it's, it's very different than normal operation and it's not a spot you really want to be in. Well, for one, your reactor is online, but your main turbine's online, so you're not, you're not making any money with this nuclear fuel. You're just burning a teeny tiny amount of fuel. And two, none of your natural feedback mechanisms are really in yet because your power is so low, you're not making enough heat to really sh slow down your reactor. Now, there are safeguards in place, um, such as on both startup rate, how fast your reactor power is going up, and on certain trip set points that are at very low power levels that are only defeated when you raise it and you're not going up too fast. That is to say, you're starting up the reactor on purpose, but it's a really weird spot to be at and you don't wanna, you don't wanna stay around for very long. Like the Dumbo octopod paddling with its ear-like fins or the grenadier's fish with its slow eel-like tail beats. At 4,000 meters, we finally reach ground again, the abyssal plain. It's covered in gray mud and rocks, dusted with the remains of marine snow, which is consumed by animals like sea cucumbers, shrimp, sea urchins, and sea worms. This is very relaxing, In some actually. regions of the seafloor, small, dark mineral deposits can be seen. These are manganese nodules. Deep sea corals manganese and sponges nodules, huh? use them to anchor themselves on the bottom of the sea. Though life is sparse on the deep sea floor, even down here there are oases. In the rift valleys, where tectonic plates are splitting apart, magma heats up seawater and creates dark jets of water and minerals as hot as 400 degrees Celsius that form elaborate chimneys and towers. Kind of like where there's believed to be life deep beneath the ice of Europa, if assuming there's liquid water down there at all. And I remember Kurtz Kazat mentioned in a different video that this is where life would hang out if, say, we lost the sun and the rest of Earth was frozen. There's enough um, geothermal heat down here 
to um, have some liquid water and have this little oasis as Earth drifts as a rogue planet through space. All fascinating stuff. Extremophile bacteria use the minerals to create organic substances that are the basis for unique ecosystems. As we descend further, we reach the deepest point of the abyssal plain at 6,000 meters. For most of the seafloor, this is as deep as it gets. But if so we want to, to get trend. to the deepest point of the oceans, we're actually only halfway there. Let's enter the Hadal Zone, the underworld of the sea. <laughs> Love these names. It consists of long, narrow trenches that only make up around 0.25% of the oceans and are among the most extreme environments on Earth. Only extremophiles exist down here, like the ethereal snailfish that holds the record for the deepest living fish ever seen at around 8,000 meters. Wow. We see spiky and sharp black rocks rush by as we sink down to more than 10,000. Until we reach the final slope, a trench inside the larger mar Yeah, here we're at far higher pressure than any nuclear reactor. <laughs> it's just, just a lot of water. Vienna Trench with gently sloping sides that inframe a valley about 1.6 kilometers wide. This is it, the deepest point, the Challenger Deep, 11,000 meters below the surface. The water pressure here is 1,086 bar. Taking a swim here is like having to balance 1,800 elephants on top of you. That's impressive. But even here, life has found a way to thrive. Next to sea cucumbers, white and light pink amphipods wiggle their way through the water. Their size is astounding. While their shallow water cousins are merely a few centimeters long, the deep sea version can reach up to 30 centimeters. And there are other things cool. floating elegantly through the water. Plastic bags that were found by scientists in 2018. Even the remotest place on Earth is not safe from human influence. That's both impressive and disappointing at the same time to see plastic bags like that. Now, I don't think, I doubt it would look like that. It would be compressed into like this teeny tiny thing. Well, maybe plastic bags don't have that much surface area, so it's not like you're exerting, so that exerting that much pressure on something that's a plastic bag isn't really much. There's nothing left to do now and our oxygen is running out, so we begin our ascent. of traveling through I have a feeling some people listen to this video as they drift off to sleep <laughs> dark nothingness we finally see a glimpse of light we arrive back at a calm surface the oceans are so deep and as far as nuclear submarines are concerned so was never in the Navy and even if I was I'm sure it's classified but I've heard estimates of between 600 and 1,000 meters as a maximum, and hopefully the actual crush depth is considerably lower than that, just to have that additional safety margin on top of that. So you need you need super specialized submersibles to like go to the bottom of the uh, Challenger Trench. Though I will say about subs that have sank, um, even if the re the reactor core like fell out or something or was just shattered, it's going to be relatively safe. Um, at the bottom of the ocean because you have essentially a nigh infinite heat sink to absorb all of that heat because that's the main hazard that causes a reactor to melt down is just lack of ability to cool it and lack of a heat sink and well you you certainly have that underwater and that water is going to provide so much radiation shielding none of it's ever going to going to make it to the surface one of many reasons why um, submarine nuclear power plants are a good bit safer than ones on aircraft, and why a lot of those designs never got off the ground, pun intended. There is so much of them. We owe it to ourselves and to our descendants to preserve them as well as we can. There are still so many wondrous things left to be discovered. I really like this, thanks for the recommendation. This one was quite relaxing. I thought. <laughs> Might have to remember this video when I'm drifting off to sleep. Good ambient music and water sound effects. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.